just take the I B Q. Hello. Welcome to the Clemson University Computer Center. The purpose of this television tour is to show you some of the hardware we have here at the center and to illustrate a little bit about how it operates and how it relates to the system as a whole. Behind me, you can see the machine room. This is the computer itself. It's referred to as the CPU or central processing unit. It's also known as the mainframe. The central processing unit at Clemson is an IBM 370-3033. Our CPU is equipped with 8 megabytes of mainframe storage. Mainframe storage is the area which is directly addressable by the CPU and is used to store instructions and data from the programs that are being run by the system at any given instant. For the sake of simplicity, we'll assume that a byte is one character, say a number or a letter. Therefore, our mainframe storage could contain 8 million different characters. This is the master console. It's action central as far as the computer operators are concerned. From here, the operators are given a constant display of activity within the system. Queries may be entered concerning the status of any program or device, and the system will respond with the desired information. Different devices can all be controlled from the console. Also, the console will alert the operator to situations that require his intervention. The entire system may be started or stopped from this one point. The second screen on the master console is used primarily as a diagnostic tool. It can be used to see what's going on inside the system itself in order to identify problems or to monitor the performance of the system while it is running. Unfortunately, this console eliminates the need for the flashing lights that made old computers so visually impressive. Now, let's take a look at the two main methods of storing the information that the computer uses or produces. First, let's examine tape. These are the tape drives. Every science fiction movie has a few tape drives and a wall of flashing lights to represent a computer. It looks impressive, but it doesn't quite work that way. Tape is referred to as a sequential access storage device. That's a long string of words, but what it boils down to is if you want some data off the middle of a tape, you have to wind down the tape to that point to get to it. This takes time, so tape isn't the most efficient way to store and retrieve data, but tape does have its advantages. First of all, it's relatively inexpensive. A reel of tape this size will cost between $10 and $20, and for that small investment, you can store a lot of information. Here at the center, we have 16 tape drives. 15 of those 16 drives are said to be 6250 BPI. BPI stands for bytes per inch. That means you could put 6,250 characters on a single inch of tape. A tape this size is approximately 2,400 feet long and will hold over 170 million bytes of data. If you were to transfer this information to computer cards, you'd end up with a stack of boxes over 300 feet high. Our Space Saver system will hold up to 16,000 different tapes. Multiply that times the amount of data on a single tape, and you find that an incredible amount of information can be stored in an area smaller than the average classroom. Tape is primarily a user storage device. If you have a great deal of information to store, but don't have to access it or update it every few seconds, then tape is the way to go. Now let's take a look at the other main method of storing information, disks. This may look like part of an album-sized jukebox, but it's not. This is called a disk pack, and it's used to store data. A disk pack is referred to as a random access or direct access storage device as opposed to tape, which is a sequential access device. Actually, the record analogy is not a bad one. Suppose you want to hear the last song on the side of an album. There is no law of physics or man which states you have to listen to the entire side in order to get to the last song. You just pick up the tone arm and move it to the last song. If you feel particularly perverse, you can listen to the last song, then the next to the last, and so on. Or you can just skip all over the surface of the record, listening to a bit here and a bit there. At this point, you'd be said to be crazy, but you would also be said to have random access to all the music on that side of the album. The analogy fails at this point, since the disc pack doesn't store information like a record, but like a tape, using a magnetic storage medium. The medium is usually ferrous oxide, a technical name for rust. The plates of the disc are coated with this substance, and information is stored in a magnetic pattern. The disk pack lives inside the disk drive. When the disk pack is placed in the drive and the drive turned on, the disk begins to spin until it reaches a final velocity of 3600 RPM. At this point, a series of read-write heads, which resemble 
tiny tape heads and are mounted on steel arms, move out over the surface of the pack. The arms are servo controlled and move back and forth over the lateral surfaces of the pack at very high speed. This lateral motion, coupled with the high rotational speed, produces a device which can go from any given point on one side of the disc pack to any given point on the other side in a fraction of the time it takes you to blink your eyes, reading and writing information as it goes. How much information? Quite a lot. A single disc pack of this type, a 3330 Mod 2, will hold 200 million bytes of data. We have two banks containing 32 drives, which give us a total storage capacity on this type of disk of 6.4 billion bytes of data. An interesting point concerning the disks is that the heads don't actually touch the surface of the disk. On the 3330s, for example, the heads are said to fly between 50 and 70 millionths of an inch above the surface. An analogy to this would be a 747 jet flying continuously around the world at a velocity of 600 miles per hour, but at an altitude of 5 inches. Besides the 3330s, we also have two other types of disk devices. One type is the 33502 drive, which works in basically the same manner as the 3330, but due to improved technology, can hold 635 million bytes of data and access it at a much higher rate of speed. The third type of device is known as a 2305. It obviously looks different from the other two types of disks and in fact operates differently. First, the 2305 disk spins at a much higher speed, approximately 6,000 RPM. Second, the surface area of the disk is smaller. Third, there are many more read-write heads which do not move back and forth but are instead fixed to laterally cover the recording surface. This results in a device which can only hold 11.4 million bytes of data, but which can access that data at a much greater speed than the other two types of disks. Disk is primarily used as a system storage device. For example, programs waiting to run and data ready for output are stored on disk. Also, people on terminals who need rapid and immediate access to their data utilize disk for storage. We've now seen the computer and the two main methods of storing data. Now let's take a look at some of the ways of getting that data in and out of the system. First, teleprocessing. There are many people who utilize Clemson's computer who are not physically located at the computer center. The computer communicates with these users by the use of teleprocessing. The devices you now see are called modems. Modem is an acronym which stands for modulator demodulator. The electronic information from the computer is modulated into an audio tone which can be sent down telephone lines. On the other end, another modem demodulates the tone back into electronic impulses that a terminal or even another computer can understand. By the use of teleprocessing, the resources and abilities of the computer can be spread all over the country. Now let's take a look at some of the input-output devices at the computer center. This is a card reader card punch. It can read cards at the rate of 1,000 cards per minute and punch cards at the rate of 300 cards per minute. This is an optical mark reader. It reads papers on which pencil marks have been made on certain areas of the page. Some examples of this would be multiple choice tests or survey polls. This is a high speed chain line printer. Now we'll show you where it gets its name. If you look carefully on the chain, you can see different letters, numbers, and symbols. There are four sets of alphanumeric characters on the chain, and the chain itself spins at high speed. The system knows the position of every character on the chain. When the proper character is in its proper place, a hammer comes out from behind the paper, striking the paper, forcing the paper up against the ribbon and the character, which in turn prints the character on the page. This printer has 132 characters on a line and can print up to 600 lines per minute. Some of our other printers print approximately 2,000 lines per minute. We have a little demonstration of our printer for you. Most computer centers demonstrate their printers by having them draw pictures. But here at Clemson, we have a little different demonstration.
The device you now see provides us with another form of output. It's called a digital incremental plotter and permits us to get computer output in a more graphic form. One example of this is a local surveyor who rather than draw out his plats in longhand, utilizes the computer and the plotter to give him a perfect print every time with no mistakes and no erasures. Now let's get to the bottom line. If you'd like one of these computer centers for your very own, we can arrange that. Let's fork over seven and a half million dollars. No checks, please. Well, let's suppose you save up your green stamps long enough to get one of these. Well, you're not going to be able to start using it immediately. There are a few other odds and ends that you have to take care of. Among others, a massive air conditioning system to keep the computer cool, a special device called a motor generator, which boosts the frequency of the electricity the machine uses from your average 60 hertz to 415 hertz in order for the machine to run more smoothly. Another item is the UPS system, which stands for uninterruptible power supply. If the power to fail, the UP system gives us approximately 30 minutes in which to bring down the computer system in an orderly fashion. Now most people don't think about this, but what do you do if you have a fire in a computer center? You can't use water, and you can't use foam too well. But we do utilize a system called Halon, which allows us to put out any fire in the computer room in less than 60 seconds without doing any damage to any of the hardware there. Finally, what do we get for this investment in hardware and equipment and all the machinery that you've seen in earlier portions of this program? Well, at the university, some of the various uses of our computer consist of teaching, research, administrative uses, such as payroll for everyone who works there, and keeping up with alumni. And also, the computer supports over 30 state agencies. All things considered, the Clemson University Computer Center is a large and integral part of life at Clemson and indeed the state of South Carolina.